Effect, Seismic Edition. I have someone here that I'm going to go on the record and say this is the guest and the person that I'm looking forward to seeing the most this weekend. So please don't, all the other artists, no disrespect, but this is someone <laughs> who I'm so excited. I have the one and only A Vision. Uh, Welcome. Thank you so AKA much. AKA. I got a lot of pressure now. Jeez. No. <laughs> A lot of pressure. There's no pressure. I gotta go back and change my setup. <laughs> <laughs> well, we I kind of want to talk really quickly about how we initially met. I feel like I'm becoming now notorious for having these awkward run-ins or introductions. We had my last guest, I met them on their tour bus, and it was a super awkward kind of thing. And then with you, we were actually at Skyline Orlando. Yeah. After party this year, and I was well before that. I was with Steph Somi. Shout out Somi, we love yeah, you. Yeah, she's awesome. Um, and our mutual friend is Daily. Yeah, hot since eighty two. My buddy. Yeah, he's amazing. Yeah. And so we were there, and you know, Somi finished her set. I was kind of doing TM duties, getting pictures of her, obviously keeping her hydrated with yeah. tequila. <laughs> <laughs> so we were taking some shots, and you know, with Daily, and then we get to the very end, and. Just to give you an example of how lit I was, I told Chris Lake to turn off the lights oh my when we were God. leaving. <laughs> so in that moment, um, I see you and I introduced myself and you're like, hi, I'm Tony. I was like, Tony, <laughs> nice to meet you. I was like, what's your name? And yeah. he's like, oh, I'm also, this is your t yeah. TM? TM, yeah, yeah. TM. And he's like, I'm also Tony. And I went straight up Sopranos <laughs> and started talking like, Oh, the Tonys. <laughs> <laughs> and you did this. You just laughed. You yeah. laughed and you were so cool about it. And I was just on one. And then go into like 15, 20 minutes. We're all still hanging out. I'm still just throwing these corny dad jokes out. And Steph's like, you, you know who that is, right? <laughs> and I was like, no. And she's like, that's a vision. I was like, wait, 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 what? I love a vision. And she's that's like, so yeah, funny. that's a vision. <laughs> was yeah. like, and then I told her, I was like, I cannot believe you just let me. Listen, I'm I'm pretty like pretty chill. <laughs> Daily's tour manager, also Frank, is, Frank, is one of my good friends too for for years. You know, I know Frank in the New York scene. So you know, when you get to go see your friends and your 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 buddies that you haven't seen in a long time, it's nice. So you just get the chill. Yeah. Especially, I think we I played EDC Orlando before that. If, oh yeah, that I was there. Was that the same weekend? Um, God, like everything just blurs together. I don't. Remember. Or no, EDC Orlando. Oh, that's actually this weekend. I played, Maybe EDC Vegas. Oh, no, there was, some, there was, there something, was something before. Else. That was the after party for something. Yes. Was there another? I don't know. Well, Whatever. Scarlett. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. and to your point, and I want to, I've been waiting to, to bring this up, mm -hmm. and I'm so happy that I get to do it now, but you received one of the nicest compliments from Daily Hot Since 82 and So Me. We're there, and we're sitting in the green room, mm -hmm. and we're all there, and... Daily was talking about you, yeah. and he was like, you know, it is so hard to follow <laughs> one of a vision's tracks. Anytime I play in a vision track, yeah. I don't know how to follow. He's like, because it just raises the energy and yeah. the levels, and it's crazy. Because um, when I, I, I think that's just like part of like where I'm from. You know, mm -hmm. New York is very big. It's the it's the Big Apple. Mm -hmm. You know, and you have to have that personality to match it. Um, especially in my music, that's that transcends to me big time mm -hmm. um so i could i i, I get what he's saying 100 percent. but it, it was absolutely an, an amazing compliment uh for me because you don't really hear that a lot you know no. and and getting that from daily was you know hats off to him yeah he and just... i've done some work for daily on his label and uh, it was like one of my first house releases. And that was really me just saying like, you know, I'm, I'm here to do it all in a way. And, and having daily support, it was, was big for me, you know, yeah. especially it was right before the pandemic we dropped that. So oh wow, having his support, he's been, he's been on my side the whole time. This whole, this whole journey has always been on my side. Well, it's easy too, because your music matches. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's you. like you said, I, yeah. I know you're giving them a lot of credit, but I'm going to yeah. give you a million times more Thank credit because no, you're the one that. you're between your work ethic and just getting to talk to you and get to know you yeah. at the after party. I was like, wow, like yeah. you just really impressed me. And Thank I just you. respected you even no, more so as an artist, as a person, because, you know, at the end of the day, like we meet so many different people yeah. you come across all different kinds and we're of all human. Life. You know what I mean? Like, I, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people get caught up and it's very easy to get caught up in this industry and become, you know, big headed. 
Mm-hmm. You know, start playing some big shows. You start playing, you know, amazing festivals, and and you get taken care of very nicely sometimes. Mm-hmm. And it's very easy to just start having a big head. And uh, for me, uh, it's not why I'm here at all. I'm here to just do my job. Yeah. You know, it's a job at the end of the day. It's a it's a really fun job, <laughs> yeah. but it, it's still my job. Yeah. And and my goal is to make sure that I play the best set I can play, make the best music I can make. And and leave a legacy behind me. You know that's that's the main and big picture. Of and all you this. literally, and to, to your point, you also mentioned that, and that was one of the things you yeah. were talking about. You're so humble, oh, which you. again, I think that like kind of matches yeah. Daily's energy as well. <laughs> yeah, and Daily's cool as hell. So me and yeah. Um, but like you said, with your music, I actually watched your documentary oh, thank you. that you did, which is super unique. So if you haven't seen it, we'll have all the links. But it's called In My Mind. Yes, and I highly recommend that. It's also on YouTube but you need to see it. But I learned so much about you and I haven't seen artists do that. So essentially, can yeah. you tell people about what that was? It was really just building a personality behind my music, letting people know why I do this and, and the creativity that goes into this rather than just putting something out and it's it's either going to smash or not smash. For me, it didn't matter if that those records went number one or they just sat there. It was mainly to just tell the story behind everything. So... It gives the listener a little bit more about me and, and why I make certain music and, and why I play certain music. And um, it was really just to hone in and, you know, be with me in my studio and, and get to know me a little bit more, yeah. you know. And, and I think that's so important as you're building a career to have people really understand why you're there. You know, this wasn't an overnight thing. This was something that took a while for right. me. And and it might look like it was a short thing, but for me, it took, you know, I've been going at this since I'm a, a teenager. Yeah. Well, let's talk 13. about that. Yeah. Because that's something that you see in yeah. the, in this documentary is, like you said, you really take people on the journey. And yeah. You're walking down your childhood yeah. streets. It's crazy. So talk about that. Like what that, because you said it was like, it's been 20 years. Yeah, that years. whole moment. I haven't, you know, I, I've, I've passed my old house a bunch and, you know, checked in on the block, but like those. That moment of living there was such a huge part of my life. You know, it was the first time I was introduced to so many things, uh, you know, music, baseball, an amazing childhood that I can't thank my parents enough for. Wow. You know, those those Christmas mornings, like th- those important Christmas mornings were all in that house. So it's like there's a lot of memory there. And that block used to feel so much bigger than what it was, you know, like because I was a kid just riding my big wheel down that hill. And, uh, you know, when you come back to it and you start looking around, you, you start remembering, like, all those little moments that, that, that just made you you, you know? Like, the first time I rode a bike was on that block. All that yeah. stuff was on that block. So there was a lot of inspiration that came from living there. And uh, I just wanted to reflect on that and just show, like, hey, you know, this is where I'm from, a small little block in Staten Island, and uh, it has a lot of history for me. And it's nice to always go back and reflect on those things. Yeah, it was really cool to see. And you show in there, like, your actual, like, the garage, right? That was the studio. So my dad built a studio. He took out the whole basement, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And half the basement was studio. And he took out some of the garage and and made that a studio as well. So my whole life, I grew up with a studio in my house, even now. Wow. So now that I just bought our first home, me and my fiancé bought our first home, and now I'm like, oh, God, I have to move from the studio now. Like, I don't know. It's a mixed emotion because I can't wait to do my own thing mm-hmm. and, you know, build a, my own new room. But, like, it's also like, wow, I wrote a lot of music down here. And, like, there was a lot of 4 a.m., 5 a.m. nights that I went upstairs to sleep. But, like, what happened downstairs was straight magic, you know, and wow. and not being there anymore it's 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 a bittersweet moment you know yeah. it's definitely like i'm um, sad to leave it obviously i could always go back but you know it's time to you know for the next thing yeah and there's there's a particular song and i guess if you can expand on it that you had your dad involved yeah your dad was, actually sang correct yeah, or in harmony with you because i think that's also unique to you and yeah for people that haven't seen it you do take people on your production journey yeah. you literally show from the vocals to your thought process to the to the words and just there's a lot of layers to it. Yeah, there is. Like 
you're more than just like a blooming onion at yeah. <laughs> Outback. There's a lot of layers, there, there, there <laughs> like is, blooming, <laughs> lots of layers, but there's so much that you go through and you talk about. And that's what I think is so unique, again, like to you, because a lot of, yeah. that's a whole skill in itself. A lot of it people is. just, it just lives in their heads and they don't really know how to articulate yeah, it, but you being do such able a great to get job. It out. Yeah, being able to get it out. Like if you went on my voice memos in my phone, there's idea after idea. That's how like some of my bigger records start, I think. Um, but yeah, being able to get it out is such a big part of this process. Like it, it's everyone could technically be a producer now, but like if you're able to take what you have in your head and and the ideas that you have in your head, then you're really you're really doing it. You know, like it's funny. Me and Maceo Plex will go back and forth with like we'll hum something or he'll hum me something. Really? And yeah, all, all the time, all the time. And then you watch like that's some of the biggest records, and 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 it's that's a part of the process, which is fun, and. Uh, the fact that I'm able to bring it to life really makes it something special for me. But going back to in my mind, yeah, my, my dad wrote, um, well, he sang part of the harmony for me. Um, I wrote that track at like two o'clock in the morning, wow. three o'clock in the morning. I don't know what it was like. It was, we were, we were in the middle of the pandemic. So I had a lot of things bottled up mm -hmm. and that was just my way of saying it. But um, yeah, my dad was, he sang all the harmonies for that record. My dad used to, you know, he had a disco band back in the, the 80s. He wrote a few hits for himself, but uh, yeah. So was that something that he kind of pushed on you or was it no. something you naturally just kind of no, gravitated it, towards? It, I'll be honest, I started on the drum set when I was like three years old. My dad bought us, you know, my, my family, I would say, I forgot who bought me my first drum set, but my family's very musically inclined. My, my aunt sing, my dad can sing, my grandfather sings. Uh -huh. And, you know, it, it's a very musically inclined family. Um, so I would say it just kind of naturally happened where uh, I picked up drumsticks and, you know, my dad taught me a few little things, but I had a natural ear for music um, because it, it's weird. I, I started playing piano as a kid as well, and I, I didn't like piano, but I wish I stuck with it because I probably wouldn't have been an amazing pianist right now. Mm -hmm. But... um. It's all right. I, I have my ear for that, but it's <laughs> it's um, yeah. Drums just stayed with me my whole life, from all the way up until high school. Um, it helped me get a scholarship in college too. So it it's it was it was nice. Wow. Um, but from three years old on, my dad was working with me, just you know, playing music. We would jam. I would ask him to come downstairs. He would sing. We would play whatever. And uh, those were those childhood memories that you can never forget. Um, but it was never pushed. But my dad always said, I was a big baseball player as well as a kid, and uh, that's always stayed with me too. But um, he always told me music is going to take you further than baseball. And I, I, don't, I don't know why he said that, but I, I think you know, the odds are definitely against you when you're playing baseball. There's a lot that goes on to, into it that you, know, you hurt yourself, which happened to me. Oh, wow. And uh, you know, it's, it's a hard sport to, to win at. But um, he always said music is going to take you further, and he was right. You know, and granted, there's been moments in my career where, you know, aunt, you should, you know, should look at something else just in case, or you could, you know, you could always be diverse. And, and I respect my parents for that. And, you know, they were totally behind me, but they were always making sure that their son's best interest was, you know, to make sure that he's successful. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think my initial reaction was to be defensive about it and uh, make sure that nothing's going to get in my way. Right. To doing this and um i think if i didn't get defensive about it they would have questions so i think they were kind of testing me in that situation but yeah no it, music was never forced or pushed but it was definitely in the bloodline yeah so i well then i don't know what my life would be without music well just to think about the support you had so i think like your childhood in particular something that stood out for me so when i was growing up i would sneak out of the house yeah. or i would do these different things to <laughs> you mentioned like I want to talk about like the teen nights, for yeah. instance, because yeah. that's, you know, for, for that age, because you're talking about being in the club and you said your age I was like, wait, 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 what? And then yeah. I'm thinking of back when we would go, like that was my first time as 16. Yeah. When I went to my first club, but it was nothing on the level of, I think, for you going to the, New York. So yeah, it was talk like about the closest like, thing towards like adult nightlife. Yeah, tell, like, talk about it that was, experience. It was pretty much, the experience was adult nightlife just without alcohol because it's illegal mm -hmm. but I'm, i mean i'm sure kids snuck in alcohol it was just what it was but yeah i was i was a 15 year old kid 
started my Club Abyss residency. It was insane. A residency at 15. Yeah, no. So it was <laughs> so me. I mean, that's like so wild to me. me. Um, my boy Nero, who was like my manager at the time, he was he was my uh, he was the host of the night. So like his his group was the promo group, and they would pretty much hire all the DJs that had the residencies. So um, I don't know if you're familiar with DJ Four B. I am. Yes. So he was also a resident. We started our first teen night together when we were 15 years old outside of Club Abyss, and then we stayed tight, and we all ended up at Club Abyss. And then um, my buddy Vinny was also a DJ. And it was kind of my whole teenage that we were together. And we was going from club to club to club. And it was the big goal was to get to the adult nightlife and build that same vibe into an adult club. But um, luckily, the owners of Club Abyss owned Deco Lounge, which was like the 18 plus club. But yeah, we were 15 years old, 16 years old, rocking out, you know, 2,000 kids, 3,000 kids on a busy, busy <laughs> night. Yeah, no, it was, it was impressive stuff. And the... The thing back then was, you know, you had to promote yourself to make sure people are coming for you as well. So, like, if you didn't bring 100 people with you, you're going to get in trouble. Really? Who, Not, was, who was monitoring? Was that, that the promoter that like or the... the... The main, like, the, the general managers Got of the it. clubs. Like, they were making sure that we were hustling. So, we would... I was working on music at the time, too. It was funny. I had, like, teen night hits. Like, I had, like, anthems oh teen nights. Yeah, it was We're going to have to hear all. some of these. Yeah, oh, no. I'm, I, we'll <laughs> no. never hear that. We'll never hear that. No. But, um... The guys who are listening to this that that know know what records I'm talking about, <laughs> but um, yeah, like we would have to hustle. So every, you know, every other Friday we were going out as a promo group, DJs included, and going out and handing out flyers in the mall and and talking to people and handing out anything we can get people through the door. We were doing, and it was impressive. We we would crush. I mean, everywhere from. Club Abyss all the way down to the shore. So like Jersey Shore, like that was that was our teenage. Like we were running into the Jersey Shore cast members as we were playing oh, these clubs. And then I used to have a waiver signed from my parents. When I was 17, I was starting to play Club Karma. And uh, I would have to sign an MTV waiver. I was on the ABC list as a DJ, so I didn't get in trouble being underage in the club. And yeah, I remember going into my senior year of high school and telling my principal that I was going to be late to school on Monday because I had to play Sunday night. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's just, I think there's just something so special about New York in comparison to anywhere else in the country. Yeah. Yeah. That's just I mean, a unique so experience like, with me. I, we, I grew up in Staten Island and then Manalpa, New Jersey when we moved. So like high school was, I was in Jersey, but even still, I mean, my whole area of that township is from New York. Like, all my friends are from New York. It's, it's, everyone's from New York in my area. But, um, it's a different, yeah, it's a different vibe. It's for sure. You know, it's, it's crazy how different things are over there. And I think, like, the mentality is always the hustle, hustle, hustle. But, like, even still, like, me and my partner, uh, we own, you know, a few businesses together. But at that time, we owned a, a DJ and production company. We still have it, but, um, we we used to get, you know, waivers from school letting us to like leave early so we can go do a job. Like if we had a production job in the city or in Brooklyn, we would we would get a waiver signed and we would get excused from school. Also, we were doing all the school stuff for free. But yeah, that was like our that was our life. And it was kind of funny cuz out out of high school I already knew what I wanted to do, but um I still went to school for 2 years. And then once our business started getting more serious and my career started getting more serious, I was like, I'm, I'm done. And there's no, there's no point for me to sit in this classroom. I, I'm wasting time. Wow. So, yeah, two well, years into college, I was it. Really? Yeah, I got my associates in music technology. I have a, an associates in, I guess it's science. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. And you even talk about um, just in these clubs as well. Yeah. Because I think, you know, obviously you're producing music, you're playing music, but then let's talk about some of those I mean, you mentioned like Marco yeah, yeah. Corolla. Yeah, at eighteen years at old. At eighteen yeah. years old. So Getting that stuck into Pasha to see my cousin Victor. Like th those like those moments you can never take from me. Like those were such an it was such an early stage in my career that I was mesmerized by all of it. You know, I was in I was in a New York nightclub at seventeen, eighteen years old, at four or five o'clock in the morning and my parents being cool with it 
and I think I, I have to thank my friends for that because I always had older friends, like a, the kid Nero I mentioned before. Mm-hmm. He's one of my best friends. He was he was taking me out, you know, and he was responsible for me. And he knew that, you know, this kid can't come home drunk. Don't touch any drugs. Like, he was very, very on top of me with that. And I, I, owe, I owe him a huge thank you for that because, uh, you know, he kept me level-headed. And my parents, obviously, I was scared as hell to come home high or something <laughs> like that. But, uh... But yeah, I, you know, I kept level-headed and and it was really just being able to experience nightlight at at such a young age took such a big toll on me as a DJ where it's, I know how to work a room, I know how to read a crowd. Those moments were so key for me as a DJ and and a producer because you're so inspired at that time that, you know, Mm -hmm. you feel like you can come home and make anything. You feel like you could come home and make Thriller. You know what I mean? Like, that's how (laughs) cool it was for me back then. But there was, it was such a magic moment in New York and I kind of caught the tail end of like the real New York club scene at that time because now there's really not much of a club scene as far as like going into a club now it's big big venues in New York there's still some clubs but Mm -hmm. in the city specifically there's not that like Manhattan venue that's just like wow this is like it's packed with 4,000 people it's a big room I feel like those days are kind of you know done in New York City but I caught the tail end of that and, you know, seeing Marco Carolla at one of the clubs I was a resident at, Deco Lounge, it was like, what the hell? You were opening, on? right? Like, no, I didn't open. I didn't know. I opened, you know, it's funny. I opened for Steve Aoki <laughs> <laughs> and I played, I played techno and house music and it worked. That was the motto there. Like you could, it was an open format club, but you know, they wanted house music in the beginning. Then you could play hip hop and then you close out with house music again. But yeah, I played, they shut down the highway that night. It was crazy. There was a few nights where they shut down the highway to get into the club because it was so packed. Wow. Yeah. New Jersey had a little bit of a run of nightlife. I mean, it's it had a long run, I would say, at least 20, 20 years, 20, 30 years. But um, now it's done. There's nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then how would you say, because I, this is another thing that I think is very unique to you and the only other person that I really see do this a lot and this is why like i compared you to carl cox mm-hmm. uh, because i know that's, that's, that's like, the king yeah i'm telling like you that. that's how much i oh, thank when you. you listen to his music it's so resemblant of or re- it resembles a lot of his sound because yeah. you're playing like you said these big beats but you are able and even in this this album that you did in my yeah. mind you touch on a little bit of disco you have yeah. t- i mean you've done drum code adam yeah, bayer yeah. plays one of your yeah, songs yeah. i've heard I was Absolutely. like, oh, I, I never knew it was your song. Yeah. And then I was like, oh my God, I've, I hear this in his sets yeah, all the yeah. time. But, you know, in techno, then you play house. So yeah. how does that kind of, I mean, is that? <laughs> yeah. It's funny because this day and age, you're so labeled. Exactly. Right. And I hate that. Mm-hmm. Like, I, for me, I don't go into the studio ever thinking like a one track minded producer. I want, I want to make house. Like the other day, I made a garage track on my laptop going into the, on the plane. And, um, that's the problem with today. Uh, I can be a house DJ, a techno DJ. Fuck, I, I can play drum and bass for all I care. Mm-hmm. But as long as it, it's in sequence and, and it makes sense and you know when to do it and when it's the right moment, that's what matters. That's what being a DJ is. It's mm-hmm. reading the room, when to break it down, when to build it back up, when to smash the room a few times. And, you, you know, it's a journey. And uh, you can't play hard tracks after hard tracks because by... In an hour, your your crowd is burnt. You know, you go to these festivals sometimes, and everyone's playing super fast. And what that's doing to the crowd is just burning them out. So they have to just keep partying to stay alive. You know, and and that's not great sometimes because then you have a zombie crowd. And right. uh, I don't, I personally don't like to play for a zombie crowd. But I think the importance of like even within my mind was I wanted to reflect that I'm just not a techno producer. I could do house. I could do disco whatever i want and and that's the that's the beauty of an album you're supposed to reach those goals with that and even on my sec like i'm gonna definitely do a second album and i plan to even dig a little bit deeper and just really touch on what's inspired my whole career and um i think what opened my mind up a lot was maceo plex like really just telling me to dig deeper he he knew he had like he knew i had it in me to dig deeper and he was like dude i want to hear everything i want to hear vocals I want to hear you like reach for everything. He's like, I want to hear what you got. Yeah. And and if you don't bring it to me, we yeah, can't you referenced be that. So how did you guys 
Yeah, because uh, like you said, I now I feel like you guys are brother. I have to show yeah. you a meme that I made. I showed it. Oh my to god! <laughs> no, we we've. I haven't posted it yet because I wanted you to do this interview first. <laughs> <laughs> we've gotten very close over uh, the last few years. No, he's amazing, he and is. you guys, like you said, he's another one who is so yeah n next level yeah, and yeah. in his sound. And so you talk about that a lot as he well. Is. How he pushes you and like I yeah. want something so. Tell us about that yeah, whole Yeah, he's been super inspiring for me. I mean, I've always wanted to work with Eric, even mm -hmm. from when I was a kid. Like, the, if I could have picked, you know, a producer out of a hat, it would have been Maceo Plex mm -hmm. or Matrix when he was doing the Matrix stuff, too. That stuff was insanely inspiring when I first started getting into it. But um, I met Eric. So Eric's tour manager was very close with my manager. Um, his name is JP. And... Uh, Big New York history there with both sides, and uh, my management kept sending JP my tracks and made him a folder. Just you know, send to Eric, and you know you don't hear anything back because at that time I was just you know a little Tony, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> little Tony. <laughs> yeah, but um, he uh, he finally started listening to my stuff because JP was just like spoon feeding him, you know. And um, there was one track I made called "In My." Um, oh my God. Holy shit, I forgot my own track name. It was on Carl Cox's label. Um, what the fuck was it called? Is this the one that you have in the, or he he's playing it? No, he. It's a different one. Carl actually said if it was his last set forever, he'd start my track off with his set. Yeah. We need to know yeah, this name. In that interview. We need to... Oh my God. I can't think of it. It was on Intech. Oh my God, I drew a complete blank. Kayla's looking. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll put it in. We'll, we'll find it. Tech, yeah. We'll find it. It was, oh, Mind of the Man. There we go. I knew it was something mine. Mm -hmm. um, Mind of the Man. So Eric was listening to that. He's like, yo, did you sign that record, EXJP? And we signed it to Carl. Not mad about that at all. Right. But you snooze, you lose, buddy. <laughs> exactly. Like, Shit'll get off the pot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, That's funny. So uh, I, I kind of like, I sent Eric a bunch of, you know, promos, demos, and, you know, I didn't hear much, but I caught him playing one of my tracks. And then um, I met him, I think it was like about five years ago at ADE or four years ago at ADE. And um, I was kind of timid to go up to him because like this is like one of my idols, you know, and, and I, I have a good personality where I don't mind going up to someone and saying, yo, I'm, you know, I'm Anthony, I'm a vision. But, you know, for some reason, I was just a little nervous to go up to Eric because I think like he's such a great producer that like there's there's one guy that has one up on me and that's that guy, you know? <laughs> so, so I'm like, all right, I'm a little nervous. So my management's like, y'all, I'm going to drop you if you don't go up to him right now. <laughs> so I went up to him and, um, you know, I was like, yo, I'm, I'm Anthony. I'm a vision. And he's like, get the fuck out of here, bro. Get out of here. No way. Babe goes to his wife. This is a vision. So we start talking. He's like, yo, follow me. We go into like a room like this. It was just a, like, it was like a smoking section room. And it was at the loft in Amsterdam. It was an, an industry mixer. And uh, he starts humming my tracks to me and like starts like, yo, you, I, I hear all your stuff. It's so dope, man. He's like, I want you to send me stuff. I want you to send me stuff. And he's like, he kept humming my tracks to me. And I'm like, yo, how the hell does this guy even remember my tracks? Like, this is nuts. So, you know, time goes on. We say goodbye. Cool. And uh, I don't hear from him till like the summer of that year. So like, Almost a whole year goes by, and I sent him a bunch of stuff. But Eric's Eric, you know. Most guys don't check their emails either. So um, finally, I got in touch, and I sent him a promo for my Suara EP that I did. And he was like, yo, this is so hot. And he's like, please send me your next demo. And I had that shit ready to go. Oh, you're like, yeah, oh, yeah. It's no, funny you no, ask. No time wasted. <laughs> had that ready to go. Was yeah. sitting on the back burner for him. Wow. Yeah, and that's what stemmed the whole relationship. It was uh, an EP I dropped called Innocence, and it was probably my biggest track on LM outside of Baby and in my mind. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that started the whole relationship. And then I played Time Warp in New York, and he was playing Time Warp in New York, and then we started, you know, talking. And at that time, I sent him demo after demo, so um, he was starting to get familiar with me, and we started, you know, building that relationship. And then um. I would say during the pandemic, I just came in hot with like record after record after record after record. And he calls me. He's like, yo, you're sending me too much good stuff. Like, I think it's time <laughs> you just need to put out an, an album. And throughout the whole pandemic, we stayed in touch. And uh, the first few shows I came out of the pandemic was with him. 
we played in Mexico City and Guadalajara, and then we played in Vegas together. And um, since then, we just, you know, every show you start building a relationship more and more, and now it's been two years, and been touring frequently with him. I feel like I'm his older brother. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, he's he's been a blessing for me, without yeah. a doubt. He's one guy that I can say that when you when you give him good music, he's going to back you 100%. He doesn't give a shit if, you know, someone more important is playing before him or after him. He's going to fight for you to play those slots because he wants his boys wow. with him. And um, I respect the hell out of that. And if there's a, a proper way to do things like that, it's, it's that way. Yeah. You know, he lets the music speak first. And uh, I'm all about it when it comes to that with him. Yeah. And, um, yeah, like over the years, we... we gained a really great relationship that's amazing i talk to him all the time yeah at least once a week i'll see him tonight see him well, tomorrow yeah and you guys actually went i'm, I'm so bummed i missed it because i was yeah. gonna go to city fox oh that was a good one uh, yeah. oh, I, I mean I'm it sure. rained it rained <laughs> right. so like it, it was kind of a bummer but it's amazing how the weather too yeah the weather i mean we still did our bit. thing it was it was still a great show but um We've been going back to back almost every time we play now, and it's it's hysterical. Yeah, like, tell yeah, tell us about that because like, I'm I'm so curious because I I know each of him. you have seen he, both of you yeah separately, but not like yeah that, like not he people. uh he always loves to go back to back, and uh I think like for both of us it's like you want to make sure you have those those bomb records like ready to go when when you're gonna go back to back, and it's like it's just like unleashing weapons after weapons when you're <laughs> playing with him. Yeah, it's like, oh, you got that? All right, I got this. And it's like a constant, like, endless thing. But uh, first time we did it, I forgot where we were at. I think it was like we played Love Machine. It was a festival in, like, outside of San Diego. But um, I think once he realized that I can play, he mm -hmm. was like, all right, cool. I'm going to start doing this more. But he does it with a lot of guys. But now that, like, it's become a thing, it's, it's great. I mean, I love it. It's, it's, it's good because I get to go outside the box a little bit with him too like i could play different stuff i could play breaks i could play electro like he's he's fun like that so yeah. it's a good time it's yeah. definitely a good time because i feel like his sets too are so unique yeah they are and his sound they like are. you said that's why i i see that similarity yeah. and it's crazy because like when you look like if you went track for track with us we're kind of on different ends but it kind of meets in the middle somewhere like mm -hmm. it's still i always say i always say like our music always has balls you know, like that's what it is. It just has that. That's the New York. Yeah, it has balls. Yeah, <laughs> and he he has New York history too. I think. Oh, does his, he? His dad's from Washington Heights, and uh, he's a Miami boy too. So he gets it. You know, a lot of his inspiration came from New York DJs because they were all playing in Miami at that time. So mm -hmm. it's cool. We we definitely see eye to eye on that. You mentioned that I know you're pretty active on Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> you've got some some fun tweets, but yeah. you talk about that just kind of yeah. again like. Who your audience is and yeah and just making sure like you're you're creating moments with those people it's not about you it's about them you know and and creating those moments is is your job as a dj and uh it's funny i started deleting a lot of my tweets because i don't want to be controversial <laughs> at all i don't need that shit in my life but um there, i think there's some co more controversial people yeah there social is social media without a doubt <laughs> i'm just bitching about like you know it's an outlet. You get that, like, yeah, guilt. yeah. We yeah, all... I, I think that's what, like, that's what Twitter's for. But exactly, you know, in a way, I, I don't want to be like this. Uh, I'm not a hater at all by any means. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm supportive of everyone, um, as long as you put the work in. You know, well, because you have. Yeah, so and it's... I, and it's, uh, and that's, you know, it's, it's a different time now, and and social media, all that stuff plays such a huge part in my career now. So you almost have to play the same game that that anyone's going to play because if you don't, you're going to just get left behind. So for me, it's like I need to be at the top of my game on social media. I need to be on top of my music and my DJ sets, and they all have to coincide. They all have to tell the same story because if, if you're not doing that, then you're looked at differently, and, and you're not looked at the artist that you want to be. You looked at an Instagram model or something. You are an Instagram model. I am a part-time <laughs> Instagram model. <laughs> you've got some, oh, yeah. these model pictures, oh, yeah. I don't know if you've seen Forget them. But yeah, yeah, you've got some. Forget but it. like you said, but you were telling me earlier yeah. about how you used to not be so comfortable. Oh no, I wasn't. My <laughs> my manager, Jermaine, used to be like, yo, motherfucker, can you smile? Like, like, and it was just like, I was kind of just shy, you know? Even still, sometimes I'll be like, 
same poses all the time. Like, you know, I'm not I'm I'm not built for that. I'm a I'm a DJ and a producer. That's what I do. <laughs> right. But, you know, press shots, all that stuff you got to still do. Mm-hmm. But uh yeah, for a long time I was super un- like uncomfortable on the camera. Uh even like during this stuff I I like stutter all the time. I get like super nervous. But uh now I kind of found like my happy place. It's just being yourself and just letting your personality speak. Right. And I think honestly that started happening like as I started developing as an artist, as I started getting older, you know, you start to build more comfort in your skin, you know, and uh, it helps tell the story a little bit more, yeah. you know. I think it's so interesting as well. Just, I think we forget, and like there's several things you've you said, but kind of, you know, I'm an official concert goer. So yeah. I go to a lot yeah, of shows yeah. and, and I'm, I'm in the audience, but I'm also very, I, you know, I have a sales marketing background, so I'm very comfortable going yeah. up to people, cold calling, all those yeah, things. Yeah. And, like you said, I forget sometimes, even on the show, people are very stoic sometimes. Yeah. And they're introverts. Yeah. And I've, you Especially f- in this industry. A lot of guys are just yeah. studio nerds. You know? Exactly. A lot of guys don't want to go DJ. Be- like, even look at Avicii. I don't know if you yeah. watched yeah, yeah, his documentary. Yeah, he was a studio nerd. Mm-hmm. And and I, I watching that documentary can make you Rick's cry. Yeah, yeah, I cried. Really sad. Really, really sad what happened to him. But that's a perfect example of that, you know, in order for him to be comfortable on stage, he had to do certain things. And, you know, it's a matter of just finding yourself and what works for you. You know, you look at, you know, some DJs will retire early because of those reasons or, right. you know, they'll they'll take a break and just be in the studio. For some guys, that's the studio is everything for them. For me, it's everything. But I love the expression of DJing. I feel like outside of the stage i'm i'm very mellow like i'm very like i don't listen to music loud in my car like i i don't listen to techno a lot in my car um you know i'm kind of just chill when i get home and i think it's because every weekend i'm in this lifestyle that like i want the off switch to be when i go home right you know, i can't continue partying my fiance will make fun of me she's like you don't <laughs> even drink with me anymore oh. I'm like that's not true i was like i drink with you but like mm-hmm. you have to understand you know the weekend is just a constant get up mm-hmm. that, you know, when you go home, you just want to relax and enjoy the people that are around you rather than just. Right. That's your safe bombed. space. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So do you think people like producers? So let's say, you know, like we're talking about Avicii, for instance, and yeah. I feel like even more so now, like even, you know, we're talking about Creamfields. I've yeah. met some, some producers yeah. that are just straight producers. So yeah. I produce for XYZ artists that maybe, you know, yeah, that's a big hustle. Yeah, there's, <laughs> but a it's good, its own it's thing. It's a good money maker. Like yeah. you said, and they're like behind the scenes, but do yeah. you think that's more socially acceptable these days versus having oh, that pressure of like, I have to go tour. We have, you have to Without go tour. You doubt. produce this, you have to go do this. Now you can kind of sit back Absolutely. and have that safe. And have I think, space. I think now, like if there was a duo, right? That one guy, there's a few, I think, yeah. right? Where there's one guy that's in the studio and there's a guy that plays. I think that's the best combination because not everyone's built for the stage. Mm hmm. But there's also the, I'm a, I'm a DJ, I have a ghost producer, and I mean, everyone kind of always has someone writing, right? I don't have anyone that writes for me, and I'm proud of that. Mm-hmm. But that's just me. I won't do that specifically because I feel like music has been in my life, my whole life. And if I can't do that piece of that, I, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, no matter how busy I get, I will always write my music. Um, but there's a lot of guys that are too busy and I get it when you're doing 150 plus shows a year and, right. and you need the studio time. I get that a hundred percent. As long as you're putting your hands on it and you're really dialing in and on it, then you're fine. But there's people that will just con like just blatantly just buy a track. And I think that's the, that's kind of like what's wrong in the industry in a way, because you're not telling your own story, you're telling someone else's story or someone's making your own story. Right. Where, that can get a little, you know, carried away sometimes. Right. And I've heard some of those stories from artists that tell me, you know, that are either ghost producers where they've had a certain artist in their yeah. studio that's telling them, I want this, I want yeah. this, and they're just doing it. And then it's heartbreaking. Like yeah. you said, because you know that these people put in the work Absolutely. and they want I don't, to have that. I respect the guy that has an engineer that, you know, yeah. is working with him to get what they want out. Mm-hmm. I agree with that 100%. I, I don't agree to, you know, I don't agree on full ghost production when you're just buying tracks or doing that. But, but do you think like the favorite. industry will, I feel like the true music heads and the true people that 
are, and I, I was watching a actually like an interview with, it was like Dixon was actually talking about it, but um, how people in the industry versus, like you said, producing, just that that those particular people, there's not as much longevity with them. Or do you feel like- No, there isn't. Yeah. No, because you're chasing. Mm-hmm. You're chasing the next ghost. What if that ghost producer is too busy? He's got too many clients. Then what? You don't have music coming out for a few years? Right. You know, me, I, I have demo after demo sitting. You know, I, I think we have like 40 demos right now just ready to go. Wow. And that's just, I mean, not everything's going to get released, and that's fine. I don't want everything to be released either. But um, what happens? You're relying on someone else for your career. And this day and age, music is still as important as it used to be, because that's a way of your fans knowing what they're going to listen to when they go see you. Granted, they're not going to hear, like, for instance, you're probably not going to hear some of my album tracks tonight because I've rinsed them for the last year and a half. And for me, I want to play what's the next thing. But when you look at it as a show standpoint, people are coming to see you to play your music as well. Right. Yeah. So, so how do you navigate that? I, I'll if, feel if it someone's out. coming to see you for the first time and they've never seen you, or yeah. like you said, someone who follows you around and sees yeah. all of your stuff, you know, yeah, me, yeah, like, listens to all your out. sets versus someone who yeah. has never seen your set. You probably, you know, depending, like, I'll, I'll take a break from certain records sometimes mm-hmm. just because I don't want to overplay them or oversaturate my own music. Um, like, I've been playing my album for two years already. Right. So, like, you know, in certain situations when the party's going off, yeah, sure. Let's Space Miami. Yeah. For- <laughs> exactly. When I'm playing 12 hours, it's going to end up happening. Right. Mm-hmm. But, um... You know, I, I try not to oversaturate my own music, but sometimes that's the best way to get it heard, too. So, yeah. you know, so, definitely before the album was releasing, I was playing everything. While the album was released, I played it for probably like seven, eight months wow. after the album dropped. I'll still play a few tracks here and there. Mm-hmm. Some some that I actually don't get to play all the time either. You know, I think that's that's the fun part when you could start digging a little bit in your music, but... The amount of music that I have on my thumb drives that are my own is kind of, it's like stupid. It's amazing. No, it, it's, a great, amazing. it's a great problem. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And, you know, I I think that's um, the DJ side of me is always like, I want to play other music. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I've watched Macy Oplex play and he'll play track for track. Sometimes we play back to back and he'll be like, only originals unreleased. <laughs> and are like, all right, sure. Game no on. Yeah, Let's no, do game this. On. We did that in Greece. It was fucking hysterical. <laughs> it was just unreleased tracks the whole two hours or three hours that we played. Yeah. How fun. Okay, so let's talk about Seismic. Yeah. So you're here at Austin, and yes. what's very unique to Seismic Dance Event is mm-hmm. the longer sets versus yeah. these hour, I mean, 45 yeah. minutes an hour. So you're going to have yeah. a lengthy amount think we're, of time. I think we're like two hours. About two hours. Yeah, which is nice. You don't get that a lot at the festivals. Right. So I let's... can't do shit in an hour. <laughs> like, I'll be honest. <laughs> I try to do it like a, a build a journey and, and mm-hmm. make sure the vibe is there in an hour, but it's very hard to do. Yeah. You know? So what can people expect tonight that are tonight? Gonna see so I'm, it's kind of funny. I, I feel like uh, the lineup is very diverse tonight on the mm-hmm. stage I'm on. So you have Charles D before me. He's also a New York native. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm cool with Charles. He's a great kid. Yeah. And then um, he was just here. He opened for Christoph. Yeah. He's and... a he's a great dude. Mm-hmm. Really, really good kid. Um, And then I have Chloe after me, which is like. I've never, I've only seen Chloe play, I think, once or twice. Mm-hmm. And she's more of like a um, housey vibe. So I'm kind of stuck in the middle of like the techno and housey vibe. So I, you're going to hear a lot of different yeah. stuff from me today. I'm probably not going to play as heavy just because we're, it's four o'clock in the afternoon. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, you know, if the vibe's there, I'm always going to full send. Mm-hmm. But, uh, <laughs> but, I, mean, yeah. I don't know. You're going to have us there hyping yeah, you no. up. So who well, knows? <laughs> you'll hear a balance of everything, I think. Mm-hmm. Tonight will be a good example of, me being a DJ, straight up. You know, Amazing. there's not nothing's gonna be cookie cutter. It's I'm gonna have to work tonight a little bit, <laughs> just because of of the balance. And, you know, I I don't I'm not the type of DJ that likes to like, I'm not gonna leave Chloe off at 1:34 BPM because I know she doesn't play that. Right. You know what I mean? I have that respect factor. Um, but you know, I, I know how to tone it down right before, like you know, a few minutes before she's gonna get on. I can tone it down a little bit and make sure that the vibe is there when she gets on. But um. Not not that like I'm I'm opening, you know what I mean? But it's yeah. just common courtesy, I think, as a DJ to leave the next DJ off in a good place rather than having to reset the whole room. Right. You know, which I've dealt with before. I hate resetting the room. It's probably the worst thing to do when 
when there's no vibe, you walk into a, a space and you have to completely build the vibe from scratch. So you'd say that's a DJ pet peeve? Oh, without a doubt. Like, if What would you... be like another DJ just off the top of your head? Not to like, we're going to obviously end yeah, this on yeah. a positive note, but I'm just curious. Like, some, um, some other, Just for maybe some new DJs that don't know, like, <laughs> or that are kind of coming. Because I feel like, too, openers, you know, especially I call them quarantine DJs. Yeah. But a lot of them came and you know, yeah. they're trying to prove their worth and show yeah. their showmanship. But then they're not. And I know there's always this big debate on Twitter. Yeah. We'll talk about openers and kind of Opener, going false uh, The, the wall. opening role of a DJ is the most important role of the night. You, you set the tone. And I think being from New York and, and knowing how to open a room, that was a major part of my career. Because if you weren't a good opener, you weren't getting that second opportunity to play again. If you suck, you were not getting that second shot. And that was just plain and simple. They would never book you again. If you banged out at 1.30 BPM and no one's in the room, you that's the last time you'll see a club. That's how it was when I was starting to play. Now, I don't know what the hell changed, but like <laughs> I've walked into rooms where there's there's 10 people in the room and someone's playing 1.32 BPM, ripping techno. And I'm like, how, like, what? Like, if you want people to be invited and, and come in, you don't want to bang them over the head. You want to invite them. You want to welcome them. You know, you know, give them a shot before you give them the whole bottle. Right. Right? Um, and those are just major things that you should know as a DJ. Like, it takes time to get to that point to be able to play whatever the fuck you want to play. And that's, like, the time is what molds you as a DJ. And helps you learn how to build a vibe and read a room and know when to play certain records. And that kind of gotten, it's gotten lost, I think, on the whole festival spectrum as a, an opening DJ. I think those days are done. I think everyone expects a festival to just be full on, full force, whereas I treat a festival like a room. You know, I have this many people in front of me. This is what I have to do. And in order to get it to more people, I have to ease into that and then you know an hour before my set's over i could start bringing it in a little heavier mm -hmm. you know depending on how long i play but tonight will be a good example of you know me seeing what's in front of me and knowing where to go to leave off in a good place for the next dj nice. you know i'm not i'm not the last dj playing tonight so it's not like i could just full force but granted you're an artist people are coming to see you you still have to do your thing mm -hmm. but yeah the 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 opening DJ thing is definitely like, I feel like a lot of areas have their residents and they have their residents for a reason. And those are the guys that open for, you know, an artist coming in. So like Scott at It'll Do. I was about to Red say, Eye, yeah, literally for years. It's just about to and say. And there's a he's, reason why he's still there. He opens for yeah. all different types of artists. Exactly. That's the first, like literally you were saying that and I was like, yeah. he is the resident yeah, opener. Yeah. Even in Boston, the guys at Bijou. Talking uh, about DJ Red Eye. Yeah, yeah, that, Red Eye. Yeah. Out. DJ Red Eye in yeah. Dallas. Yeah, Will in, in, at Bijou. Like, he, he's always opening for, like, the biggest acts there. And he's been there for 10 plus years. And that was very relatable to how I started at Deco Lounge when I was a kid. You know, when Marco Corolla was coming in, there was a, a Deco resident that played before Corolla. And he was respected. And he was respected as a DJ because he knew how to open the room and play to the crowd rather than just full on full force. Wow. So yeah. So For anyone that's that's <laughs> listening that's a younger DJ, do your research, do your homework and um, you know, gain that respect and then you'll be able to move up the ladder and things will happen if you just work hard. Trust right. me. Put Absolutely. The work in. Well, on that note, what is coming up for you next after yeah. Seismic? So uh, tomorrow I play Art of the Wild in Vegas. Mm -hmm. Then Next week, which oh, I go on my bachelor party next <gasps> week in Costa Rica, and then uh, <laughs> and then um, Montreal, I play with Nicole Madubar, mm -hmm. okay. um at Stereo, which is one of my favorite rooms. Uh, Victor broke me into Stereo like five years ago, and I got to play that room a few times, and uh, I've headlined it the last time I played, which was before the pandemic. So this is my first time back to stereo since the pandemic, and I'm so excited. Have you ever been? No, I haven't. Oh, my God. Amazing room. Okay. Probably, I've heard that. I've heard, I don't know where. I think rooms. I actually heard that from Victor Calderon. Yeah, yeah, like He was on a, I was watching yeah. one of his interviews, and he was yeah, so like, talking about that. Yeah, so it's definitely. It's one of his favorites. Yeah, it's one of the best rooms in North America, hands down. 
uh, the sound system, everything, the vibe, the people, they're just, they get down and dirty. They're ready to go. Wow. You hear whistles. Like, everyone starts whistling, <gasps> screaming. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, then I, the week after that, I have the biggest show of my life. I get married. Oh. <laughs> and then <laughs> um, we do a, a tour to Argentina and then New Year's and then, yeah, New Year's. And then we're uh, full new schedule going out. Wow. So I'm excited. But, um, yeah, this, this year has been crazy. Yeah. So as we're coming to the end of the year now, yeah. is there any specific things that kind of stick out for you as highlights? Um, this last Europe run was really, really good. I, I mean, overall, the whole year was a dream come true for me. I played amazing shows. There's a lot on the list that I still want to do, obviously. But um, the last European run, every single show was just banging. It was so good. Like, every show was packed. Um, I got to meet so many new people. Just, like, I, I think the whole vibe of ADE, too, like, that that always gets me ready for the next year. Um, but, yeah, I, I really loved I played in Paris, London. Where else did I? Uh, Paris, London. Oh, my God. Oh, Berlin. Berlin for my first time. That was Oof. Oof. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I just posted a video on my Instagram and it's us leaving the club. And that I was saw that. Yeah, that was that's where you were leaving. Yeah, wow, unreal. Yeah, that was a banging ass night. Really, really oh good. Gosh. Uh, that 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 club reminded me of being in New York in the '90s. Like just the room going off, whistles, screaming. You lo you drop the volume, people just go freaking crazy. Like it was it was really good vibe. And I loved it. Um, so I I don't know. I don't have one specific highlight, I think. I think playing back-to-back -back with Victor for the first time as like a like a publicized thing. And Eric was like super amazing. Um, you know, the first time we went back-to-back, -back, me and Victor at Space was really, really cool. That was a good vibe. Oh, I bet. Yeah, that, we played for like 12 hours. It was, it was, <laughs> oh, my gosh. And I came in from Switzerland, and it was my brother-in-law's bachelor party that weekend in Miami. So I just went straight from the airport to get madness. up and go yeah, yeah yeah it was straight madness but it was a, a really really good summer like i i can't complain about anything wow. i loved everything about it well yeah. i can't wait to see everything oh, else that you do and yeah. like i said i can't wait to obviously see yourself tonight you. and then anything i mean just i feel just waiting for you to post yeah. more so no yeah we have a lot of music keep everything way. coming new yeah. music all the good things new labels so. everything yeah nice. we we're I don't want to speak too soon, but there's a lot in the works right now that's going to be um, game changing for me, I think, in my career. And, and I'm, I'm really excited to do it. Um, Wonderful. Everything coming along. And I'll definitely be working on a second album. I'm not, I don't know when it's going to come out. I don't know what label, but I have a lot more to say in music and um, I'm keep, looking forward to we'll releasing everything. Keep yeah. it up. Well, thank how can you, people you. find you? Uh, and all the things that you're doing. Onlyfans.com. <laughs> no. Um, I Instagram, at a vision, right? I have at a vision. SoundCloud, at a vision. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, at a vision. All the things. Yeah, all okay, the things. We'll have all the links, too, yeah. for this. So. Yeah, yeah. And you well, can see you my so debut much, on HBO. I'm, I, I'm featured in uh, The Sopranos, yeah. <laughs> You're joking, right? Yeah, absolutely. Oh my god! Really? See, I was like I, ten when that came out. I thought you. Were, I was like, wait, that's. I'm so sorry. You, know, I told you. Long so night. Literal. Long night for you. Yeah. Right. So long night, but I was here. This is amazing. Thank you so much oh, for of being course. here. Thanks for having and, me. Like I said, thanks for not. Uh, yeah, everything. I just adore you, and I'm <laughs> so excited you. to. I appreciate see your set tonight. So yeah, we're gonna have fun. We'll see you guys next time. Catch you on the flip side. Boom.